Well, let me start here. Um, you know, Tony and I are both 49ers guys. Five games down, it's been a bit of an infuriating start to the season. I can only imagine the vibe among the team. Like, what's the mood or the vibe like within that 49ers locker room? It's not good. Uh, it's a lot of players sort of walking to their locker, doing whatever they have to do individually and walking out. It's not a happy locker room. It's not a joyful party locker room. It seems like um, something is deeply wrong with the culture of the team. Maybe everything gets saved when Christian McCaffrey returns, but no one knows when that's going to happen. And I think people feel, not just fans, but people on the team feel like, did you know that Christian wasn't going to be here? Are we not prepared for this? It's, I mean, look at how much of an impact the loss of Christian McCaffrey has had on everything the Niners are doing. All of a sudden, they can't score in the red zone at all. Uh, it seems like the, the team was not prepared for life after Christian, and they're like struggling desperately to find a new identity, whatever that is. Grant, you had an interesting video on your uh, Twitter account where you talked about how Mike Shanahan has given up the most fourth quarter leads where he's up by 10 points or more. And Kyle Shanahan's struggles in that situation are well documented. Of course, two Super Bowls as well. Is there a similarity in their coaching styles that can explain that? Or is it is that just luck? Is it just happenstance that two guys with the same last name happen to be doing a really poor job at letting leads slip away in the fourth quarter. Do you see any similarities between them? Well, I think it's not the mark of a great coach. I think what we see with Shanahan is they, they have, they have constructed a great system that has taken over the NFL, but in terms of game management, which is really the number one job of a head coach, they're not great. I mean, great coaches handle a 10 point lead in the second half. They can put those away, but like, over a, a large sample size, the Shanahan's don't do it uh, at a satisfactory rate. So give them all the credit in the world for developing this particular system. But there's a reason Mike Shanahan is not in the Hall of Fame, despite having two rings as a head coach and one as a coordinator. It's this stuff. You know, that locker room stuff is just fascinating to me. I tend to be like an intangible guy. So that information to me almost stops me in my tracks. So I appreciate that. But looking at tonight's game, Hufunga's out the rookie Malik Mustafa in for the 49ers. John Lynch says he reminds him of Buda Baker. That would certainly work. Um, but given the quality of the Seahawks wide receivers and sort of depth and unique talents there, do you think San Francisco defensive backfield, little vulnerable tonight, might get exposed a bit? The, the Niners defensive backfield has been really underperforming all season. Last year, it was great. The DBs, just the DBs intercepted 16 passes. Traverius Ward, five. Diamond Lenore, three. Tashawn Gibson had a bunch. This year, zero. And it's a new defensive coordinator. They had Steve Wilkes last year. They scapegoated him for losing the Super Bowl, even though they gave up 17 and a half points last season under Steve Wilkes. He's out. Now they have an, a rookie defensive coordinator, Nick Sorensen, never done it before. And they have... Uh, Brandon Staley helping him out as the assistant head coach. Like Brandon Staley's good. I, so far, it looks like they downgraded at the court. I mean, the last time we saw him, he was giving up 63 points to the Raiders. Now he's like giving Nick Sorensen the answers to the test. I don't know. I, I think what the, the Niners' problems, what's, what's interesting about this team, their problems are big. It's, it's not just like, well, Devondre Campbell's washed. It's like their defensive coordinator might not be good. <laughs> when I look at this team, Grant, um, I still see an elite team, but like sort of between the 20s. And you already alluded to this. Inside the 20, it's been a bit of a dumpster fire so far. So is this the major number one pain point with this 49ers team, specifically on offense, is converting some of those opportunities into touchdowns? Absolutely. I mean, they're averaging 6.3 yards per play, which is second most in the league. So they're moving the ball up and down the field. They didn't punt in the second half against the uh, Cardinals, but they didn't score in the second half. And it's interesting, like taking Christian McCaffrey away has exposed so much about this team. So many people who get so much money, Chris, uh, Kyle Shanahan, George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, like Brandon, $30 million a year. You're not a factor in the red zone. Or, or, or Brock Purdy, you're supposed to be getting like $50, $60 million a year next year, but you don't quite have the juice, the arm strength to like force the ball into those tight windows. And really, it seems like you take away the best running back in the league. A lot of guys on this team get exposed as being like not quite the kind of player who could carry a team. 
And if that's not what you are, then why are you making thirty million dollars a year? Should should Brock Purdy really get sixty million dollars a year next year? Like, he's a good player and he's he's battling, but he's also losing to teams that are worse than him. So I think um, I think Brock Purdy has a lot to prove over the next few months. Grant, talk to me about this 49ers defensive line. To me, it looked like a philosophical shift in the offseason where you let guys like Armstead go who were hurt a lot, and you brought in a bunch of guys who are like, you know, B-minus guys. They're not your starter guys that are going to scare you, but they're durable. And I think the 49ers had a philo philosophy where, you know what, we don't have the biggest stars on the defensive line anymore, but at least they're going to be healthy every game. And maybe that will actually lead to an improvement from the defensive line. I've not seen that yet. I'm looking for that big splash game from that defense, the, the Nick Bosa three sack game that we know he's capable of. We haven't seen it. Why haven't we seen that so far from the 49ers? Oh, I, Nick Bosa hasn't been dominant since 2022. He got paid, and he all of a sudden, he's not T.J. Watt anymore. He used to be on that level, and he's huh. not anymore. And I think that, that – let's go back to the Armstead thing. The Armstead thing is very interesting. Like you said it. They kind of humiliated him. They're like, hey, you know, you've been making about $18 million a year. This year, how about six? And he's like, uh, no. And they're like, no, but that's what you're worth because you're hurt all the time. And so he went and got what he is worth, really, from the Jaguars. So kind of humiliated him, but it, it made sense because he got he, – he does have injury history. But then they turned around and gave Christian McCaffrey a new deal with two years of guaranteed money while he was injured. So, again, I'm talking about how this team is a little off. The locker rooms, you don't think the players noticed that? Eric Armstead was very popular in the locker room. He was the longest tenured player on the team. And it's like, oh, you kind of just ran him out of town. No, no ceremony, nothing. See you later, Eric. Thanks for everything. And then it's like, Christian, oh my God, what do you want? You want you want two years guaranteed? Oh, can, can we come to your, to your wedding? Are we invited? It was like, what? So I think there's a little bit of like who's in, who's out, who's part of the future, who's being taken advantage of on this team. It's a little strange as opposed to like the up and coming teams that are just pulling as one. Well, to no. your point, before Armstead, it was Buckner. Buckner was the well-liked guy in the locker room that kind of got screwed over. So this is a little right. bit of a pattern now. Correct. Dude, love, yes. love the knowledge, yes. right? So Robert Sala, just fired by the Jets. I know apparently you know him quite well, right? So um. You talk about Swords and you talk about Brandon Staley had me laughing pretty good. So is it crazy to think about maybe him taking a, a job with the 49ers midseason or is just going to collect his paychecks and just relax and enjoy sort of a uh, early exit from New York? From his perspective, I'm not sure that's necessarily the best move for him, like to just tie yourself to the 49ers midseason. I mean... <laughs> is this a sinking ship? Is it not? Can he save them? Can he not? Like maybe it's better to just relax for a few months and then see all the defensive coordinator openings in like March or April and then go to the best one. And it might be the Niners, although they got Bosa, they got Warner. They're getting a little bit older. Lenore's probably going to leave. Hafunga's probably going to leave. Traverius Ward's probably going to leave. Is that the best? Or he's like best friends with Matt LaFleur on Green Bay. Uh, their defensive coordinator is Jeff Halfley, also a rookie. He could go to Green Bay or he, I mean, I'm sure he, sure a lot of teams would want him so the Niners would be lucky to have Robert Sala back I'm not sure that that's necessarily how enticing is their defense right now I don't know I don't know about that we talk Who wants to coach Nick Bosa now because because when he doesn't fulfill his contract it's your fault right like you didn't get the most out of him mm. yeah it's good a good point. you didn't didn't resonate <laughs> <laughs> we were talking before you before you came through. Um, I put this question out to Jason about like, you know, tonight being a must win with the Chiefs on the horizon. And then he broke down the next few weeks after that. The schedule is tough here. So it's Chiefs, it's Cowboys, it's Bucks, it's Seattle again, it's at Green Bay, it's at Buffalo. What does a loss tonight mean? If they lose tonight, you're looking at a team that's in complete freefall. What's the next game they're going to win? Who can they beat? If they can't beat anyone in their division, because right now it looks like the NFC West is one of the weaker divisions in the league that like nine wins could actually win the freaking thing. So you can't beat. It's not even full strength Seattle. They're missing Woolen. They're missing a bunch of guys on defense. Uh, Cheddar Nuosu, Byron Murphy. You guys, I mean, yeah. I, to me, even if they beat Seattle, you're looking at a team that 
might go nine and eight. But if they lose to Seattle, it's like, are you going to be five and 12? Are you going to be four and 13? What is happening here? Grant, question for you. This team always seems to have a crisis point in their season. Last year, they lost three games to inferior opponents and they went on a crazy win streak. We all know they, they went to the Super Bowl. The year before that, it was the same thing. I think that was the year right before they got Christian McCaffrey, right? They had, you know, several losses. Mm -hmm. They started off, I think, three and four, something like that. And then I don't think they lost another game for the rest of the season. So, like, what is with this trend? Like, where they seem to just have this point in the season where everybody's doubting them. And to their credit, when their back has been against the wall recently, they've surprised you and like, oh, the Niners are back. But what's with their culture, their identity? Like, how do you explain why this keeps happening? Well, I think that's an interesting trend. Let's let's go back and not pay like a broad brush with this one. Last year, they they started off 5-0. and So they were hot. And then Debo got hurt. Trent Williams got hurt at the same time. And they lost three games in a row. Uh, I think the injuries had a big part to do with that because they had shown that they were – like they they beat Dallas 42 to freaking something like 10 or something week five. So they had shown that they were bullies. The the year before, they were really struggling early on in the season. And I don't think they were gonna like pull themselves out of it. They had to trade for Christian McCaffrey, and that changed everything. And then Brock Purdy became the quarterback. Like they had an infusion of talent. Um I don't I, oh, and then in 2021, they were started off slow, and then Debo Samuel became a running back. And became went on like the, one of the all time tears that you've ever seen. He could have been the MVP. He could have been the offensive player of the year. That I know it went to Cooper Cup, but I probably would have given it to Debo, considering he carried that team as a running back. Yep. Um, this year, like, what's going to be the thing that turns them around? Is Christian McCaffrey really coming back? Can he stay healthy? Can he be what he was last year? Like, I don't know. I don't think they know. I don't think he knows. And that must be another thing. It's like another cloud in the locker room. Like, what's up with Christian? Is anyone going to tell us? So. I don't really know what's going to turn everything around and and, and uh, bring this team together. Like, no team had more drama than this team this offseason. Trent Williams held out. Brandon Ayuk held in. Christian McCaffrey was hurt. Like, they're not a team. They're a collection of really good players. Hmm. But that doesn't necessarily get you. We've seen, like, throughout the years, Washington used to have awful teams that had a bunch of great players. Philly had, like, the dream team, and they'd go 6-10. and 10. We've seen it all the time. This team has to, like come together and they don't even know who's going to be they don't know who's going to be here next year like Debo Samuel what happened to him he's broken two tackles this year why is he washed all of a sudden or is he like well they're going to cut me at the end of this year I'm not going to be on this team next year I got to make sure I'm healthy there's it, it's that kind of business decisions going on each person has their own agenda on this team I would not be betting on the Niners anytime soon this is a team I would stay away from because I don't think the general public understands how dysfunctional they are. And they could beat the Seattle tonight and be like, we're back. They did that. They beat the Patriots two weeks ago. And Fred Warner's like, oh, we're back, baby. Yeah. Like, no, you just beat one of the worst teams in the league. And you're going to lose to one of the worst teams in the league next week. So I don't know, man. Graham, my, my last question on. for you. Could the answer to your question, which was, you know, how are the 49ers going to turn this around? In the past, it was Debo Samuel, it was Christian McCaffrey. Could Jawan Jennings be the answer to that question, getting that guy more involved? Could he be the catalyst to turn the 49ers around this year? More focus on that guy, more emphasis. You really think Kyle Shanahan is going to change the way he uses them? Like Kyle Shanahan is locked into giving Jawan Jennings 55% of the snaps and no more. That's the way it is. I mean, if he were given the opportunity, yes. I'd like to see Kyle lean more on Jordan Mason. Like, dude. You know how you use Christian McCaffrey and like every single play went through him and you and you and you threw the ball to him like you got to use Jordan Mason that way too. That's how your offense is set up. It's a running back centric offense. He's having a great season and you don't throw to him at all. All of a sudden the check down is not in the offense. Maybe that's Brock's fault. I don't know whose fault it is. Brock, I don't know what you're trying to prove, but you got to get back to checking down because you're worse when you don't. And uh I think Jordan Mason like you can't score in the red zone. Throw it to him. Let him run over one person in space as opposed to forcing him to go between the tackles. I think using Jordan Mason uh, more creatively would be a big one. And obviously using Jawan Jennings. Like we just talked about how Debo Samuel's having an awful year. He just, he's coming off a calf injury. He's, he's broken two tackles. How about he's the number three receiver and Jennings starts because Purdy's quarterback rating when he targets Jennings is 144. And when he targets Debo is 90. 
So like, if Debo's not breaking tackles, he's not beating man-to-man -man coverage. He He's not making contested catches. Not really sure what he's giving you as a starting wide receiver. Grant, why are, why are you so uh, – sorry, sorry, Ninja. Why are you so sure that Shanahan wouldn't give Jennings more touches? Like the decision – when Debo was in his prime, the decision to make Debo a running back was pretty innovative and I think kind of out of nowhere. I didn't see it coming. And – like the decision to just give Jennings more touches now seems like an easy decision, especially the way we've seen him dominate. Why do you think he's so stubborn or, or won't actually do that, even though it seems clear to some fans? Because look at his snap count. So, 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 uh, he started against the Rams, played 85% of the snaps, got what 12 targets, had 11 catches, 175 yards, three touchdowns. The first time he's ever gotten that kind of a a start and, and that kind of a snap share. Then the next week, Debo comes back and Debo's getting 80% of the snaps and Jenny's getting 55%. Like that's Kyle. Kyle is stubborn and he has shown throughout the years that he won't necessarily react in real time to who his best players are. Like he was starting Tevin Coleman in the Super Bowl after Raheem mm. Mostert went for like 240 or whatever it was off the bench. Like Kyle is just hella stubborn, hella Good stubborn. Point. And especially if people in the media being like, hey man, why don't you give the ball to Jennings more? He'd be like, no, don't tell me what to do. I'm Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> It'll make him not want to do it more. Reed, as opposed to Andy Reid, who like like the janitor comes up to Andy Reid's, hey, I drew up this play. It's dope. Andy's like, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's, let's, let's run it. And that's the difference between them right there. That's why I love Andy Reid. Like, it's not about Andy Reid's ego, but with Kyle, it's all about Kyle's ego. Mm, good point. I know we won both these games against Seattle last season. Typically, the Pacific Northwest, not a beacon of success in the win column for the Niners down the years. But give us a score prediction here tonight, Grant. I feel like this is two teams that struggle in the red zone. Gino and Brock, neither one really tearing it up when they're close. They're going to – a couple of guys who would have one, maybe, maybe two touchdowns in the game. So I'm thinking like a 20-16 to 16 game, a 23-16. to 19 game like one of those exciting thursday night football games where there's like not a lot of actual game planning but a lot of field goals and you got a backup kick really man if the niners are in a field goal fest with their backup <laughs> kicker out here they <laughs> i want to give the niners the benefit of the doubt and say they're going to win this game because like their season's on the line the seahawks season is not on the line and there's no pressure on them first year coach they're three and two if they lose this game it's like oh well well we were hurt and um we're still doing okay. We're, we're 500. If the Niners lose and they drop to two and four, it's like, who's getting fired? <laughs> who's who's out? So I, I just, I can't imagine. And again, if they lose under these conditions, it's like, okay, this is a dumpster fire. Okay, we're, this is officially a dumpster fire. One of the worst teams in the league. I don't think they're one of the worst teams in the league. I think they're starting their slow decline into mediocrity. And that means they win this game. Free, and then maybe next week against Kansas City. But they don't really they're, – they're not going to keep it going, and I don't think they're going to go on that run like they've been doing where they rip off 10 wins in a row. I don't think they have it in them this year. We'll see. I mean, that's that's the potential angle right there. It's that the Niners have it all to play for tonight. Seattle, I don't know. Like some people maybe thought they'd be 3-2 and two going into this one. Not a lot of folks did, but Seattle was punching above their weight in those first four weeks. Uh, Grant, let the folks at home know where they can find all of your great content. Okay, uh, I'm on Twitter, just kind of shit posting, and then I'm on YouTube, post going live. And and sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Uh, I have good. a YouTube channel, Grant Cohn, and I just started a podcast called called the Best Forty ers Podcast, just because we didn't want to leave any mysteries on that one. You can find it on Apple Podcast, Spotify. I'm around. Just Google me. Getting into various disputes with players, and and uh, uh, almost getting canceled, but then popping back up. You know what I mean? 